Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. Hello everybody, my name is Griffin, joining us today is Landon, and you are listening to episode 6 of Duels of the Peaks Core Set Battle Edition. For this Duels of the Peak, we have all chosen a commander from one of the core sets, be it the same one or different ones, it doesn't really matter, just one legendary creature from a core set and build a deck around it to battle on this episode of Duels of the Peaks. Quick reminder to go ahead and click that subscribe button to make sure that you're notified of all of our future content, including deck techs, more gameplay videos, and other EDH content. Also a reminder that this episode and this podcast is brought to you by GameGrid Lehigh. If you are in the Utah County area, please check them out. They have an amazing staff, awesome card selections, amazing selection of sleeves, just everything that you could want in your commander experience. All right, let's go ahead and begin. I'm going to pass it off to Landon, and he's going to go ahead and start us with our decks introductions and our point introductions. If you're unfamiliar with Duels of the Peaks, essentially what we've done is we've come up with challenges for the table and challenges for each individual deck to kind of make the EDH gameplay a little bit more spicy. Um, Having challenges at the table kind of makes people play routes that they might not have played before if these challenges weren't there and it opens up some pretty interesting interaction. So the generic table challenges are three points for winning the game, three points if you only cast your commander once during the game, two points if you deal 10 combat damage to each opponent, and one point if you stay at 10 or less life for one whole turn cycle. At the end of each game, we tally up all these points, and then throughout this whole year, we're gonna be keeping track, and then at the end of the year, we will see who is the winner. Len, will you go ahead and let us know what the pointage lead is at this time? So as of right now, Griffin is in the lead at 30, Peter's in second place at 25, and then Caleb and I are bringing up the rear at 14 points apiece. So there is a very substantial lead right now with Griffin. It's not that big of a lead. You guys just aren't playing very well. Yeah, we're bad. (laughs) With the challenges out of the way, let's get into the deck introduction. So today, Griffin has brought Ren and Sari to the table. They are being printed in the upcoming Core 21 set. Landon has also picked a legendary creature from the same set, and he is bringing Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. Peter is bringing back a deck that he's played a couple of times, and that is Arcades the Strategist. And Caleb is bringing Kaikar the Wind's Fury. But now let's go into the opening hands and personal challenges for each of the decks. So Landon starting us off today, and he kept a hand with Vampire Nighthawk, Sign in Blood, Snuff Out, Swamp, Arcane Signet, Dark Ritual, and Defile. And his personal challenge is to drain somebody for 10 life in one turn. Peter is going second, and he kept a hand with Monomic Wall, Traproot Kami, Forest, Crows and Verge, Forest, and Two Planes. And his personal challenge is to attack with eight creatures with Defender in one turn. Griffin is going third, and he kept a hand with Beastmaster's Ascension, Forest, Fleece Mane Lion, Herald's Horn, Forest, Oroseco's Explorer, and Battlefield Forge. And his personal challenge was to create five cat tokens and five dog tokens on the field at once. We will have the five dog tokens and five cat tokens up on the screen for you so you know that they are for personalized. For your viewing fl- pleasure. They are personalized for me, for this deck. All of the dogs are my dog and all of the cats are cats that I have on my phone because they're really cute. Caleb is going last and he kept a hand with Glacial Fortress, Snow Covered Mountain, Force of Will, Arcane Denial, Boro Signet, Soul Ring, and Skull Clamp. And his personal challenge is to cast five non-creature spells in one turn. All right, Landon starts, draws, and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn. He then taps one mana to cast Dark Ritual, adding three black to his mana pool. He uses two of that mana to cast an Arcane Signet and uses the remaining mana from the Dark Ritual and one from the Arcane Signet to cast Sign in Blood, drawing two cards and losing two life. With nothing else, he passes the turn over to Peter. Peter draws and plays down Chris and Verge as his land for turn and with nothing else, passes the turn over to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down a Battlefield Forge as his land for turn and with nothing else, passes the turn over to Caleb. Caleb draws and plays down a Sacred Foundry into play untapped, paying two life, going down to 38. He then taps the Sacred Foundry to cast a Soul Ring. He then taps the Soul Ring and casts Boros Signet. With nothing else, he passes his turn back over to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn. 
taps the swamp and casts Wayfarer's Bauble and nothing else to do. He passes the turn back to Peter. Peter draws and plays down a Plains as his land for turn. He then taps his Plains for Perimeter Captain. With nothing else, he passes the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and he plays down a Forest as his land for turn. With nothing else to do, he passes the turn back to Caleb. What a joke. <laughs> turn two, no play. Oh yeah. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays down Glacial Fortress as his land for turn. He then taps and adds five mana to his mana pool with his lands, using four of it to cast Kaikar, his commander. That is absolutely absurd. He got Kaikar out on turn two, and that's not all. He uses the one floating mana left in his mana pool to cast Skull Clamp. The single best card, I think, in his deck is Skull Clamp, and he had that out on turn two along with his commander. Yeah, I think that Skull Clamp is probably the best card in any token making deck. It's just so absurdly good, but especially with Kaikara, where you can sack the, the spirits to make the mana to attach the Skull, Skull Clamp, Clamp to other spirits, yeah, it's just... it's pretty good. It's, it's way crazy, so congratulations, Caleb. You have officially began this turn, or you officially ended this turn as the best player on this table. With Skull Clamp hitting the stack, it triggers Kaikar and he gets a spirit out of it. And on the end step, Landon responds by sacrificing his Wayfarer's Bauble to get a swamp. Let's go ahead and move to our first card spotlight of the game with Kaikar, Wind's Fury. Peter here, bringing you some spotlights for the commanders in this game. The first commander has entered the battlefield very, very quickly, and it's Kaikar Wind's Fury. Kaikar makes spirits when you cast non-creature spells and will let you sacrifice spirits for red mana, so expect a lot of non-creatures being cast from this Jeskai deck to fuel up some big spells later on. Back to you guys. Alright, thank you Peter. Landon goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and he pays 3 mana to cast his commander, Vito. With that, let's go to our second card spotlight for the second commander entering the battlefield, Vito, Thorn of the Dusk Rose. Peter here, Vito is the mono black life gain commander we've all been waiting for. He allows you to drain your opponents whenever you gain life, and the deck primarily aims to get Vito out and gain a whole bunch of life, or otherwise drain out his opponents with the other effects like Extort. Let's see what will come out of this monocolored deck against the other three colored decks at the table. Peter out. With nothing else to do, Landon passes his turn back over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down an island for turn. He then taps two mana to tap and sacrifice the Crows and Verge to go and tutor up from his library a Hollowed Fountain and a Breeding Pool which he both puts into play tapped. Choosing not to pay the four life. Big brain play. With nothing else to do, he passes the turn over to Griffin. Griffin draws and plays down another forest as his land for turn and taps all of his lands to cast Kodama's Reach. He searches his library for a mountain, puts it into play, and puts a plains into his hand. With nothing else, he passes the turn back over to Caleb. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down a snow-covered mountain as his land for turn. He then taps one blue mana to cast Preordain. This triggers Kaikar, giving him a spirit. He puts both of the cards that he scries with Preordain on top of his library and draws one card. He enters combat, swinging Kaikar and a spirit at Peter for a total of 4 damage, which Peter takes, dropping down to 36 life. Caleb moves to his second main phase and taps the Sol Ring for 2 mana, using one of it to attach a Skull Clamp to a Spirit, killing it and drawing 2 cards, and letting that other mana fizzle, he goes to his end step. That is just the power of that Skull Clamp. It was worth it. <laughs> if only you could do it at instant speed, right? That'd be Man, that would just absurd. <laughs> it's already absurd. It's already absurd. Alright, Landon goes to his turn, untaps and draws, and taps all 4 of his lands for a Crypt Ghast. That is a really card for you to have. Extort in Vito is, honestly, it may not seem like much, but over time, those extort triggers are gonna cause a lot of draining to happen. I honestly like the Crypt Guest for the extort more than I liked it for the mana doubling. It was also Honest, good for the mana doubling. It was good for the mana doubling, but like, yeah. With nothing else, Landon passes his turn over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn. He then taps four mana to cast his commander, Arcades. And let's go to Peter for another card spotlight. Peter, introduce your deck, bro. Please. Peter here. The wall deck's favorite commander is Arcades, who not only lets your creatures with Defender attack with their toughness, but will also allow you to draw cards every time you cast a creature with Defender. Having card draw stable onto a commander is no joke, and with a deck loaded with low-costing Defenders, he's sure to dig deep really, really quickly. Back to you guys. He then taps his last mana for Traproot Kami, which triggers his commander and he draws a card. That's hot. Oh yeah. 
Peter then goes into combat and swings his perimeter captain at Landon for a total of 4 damage. Landon takes it and drops down to 34. With nothing else, Peter passes the turn back to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a planes as his land for turn. He then taps 4 mana to cast his commander, Rin and Seri. Peter, would you introduce my Rin and Seri deck for me, please? Peter here for our final commander spotlight. Rin and Seri is another commander who is new to the core set. Rin and Seri allows you to make cat tokens whenever you cast dogs and dog tokens whenever you cast cats and also has an ability that lets you deal damage based on how many dogs you have and gain life based on how many cats you have. Griffin is going to be very, very quickly making a lot of cats and dogs with this two for one rate on his commander. Let's see if it's enough to outmatch the creature advantage his opponents have. Peter out. Moving into his end step, Caleb has a response, casting Generous Gift, targeting Peter's Arcades. Arcades is destroyed, and Peter gets a 3-3 Elephant for his troubles. You know what's funny? Caleb did more on my turn than I did on my turn. He did one thing. You did one thing. He did the same amount. Well, he casted a spell, got a trigger, got a spirit, so technically he had two things. Oh, that's true. He did get a spirit. With no further game actions, Caleb goes to his turn. He untaps and draws and plays down his Mystic Monastery as his land for turn. He then pays one mana to attach Skullclamp to Kaikar. He goes to combat, swinging two spirits and Kaikar at Peter. Now you're thinking, why did Caleb attach that Skullclamp to Kaikar? This is because he was trying to pump up Kaikar's power to deal the 10 damage as part of our challenge to Peter. So this is kind of what we were talking about um, when we have these challenges that are a little bit different than what we're normally trying to do, it opens up like interesting lines that probably otherwise wouldn't have happened in the game. Peter blocks one of the spirits with Traproot Kami and it takes a total of five and takes a total of five damage, but then gains two life from blocking with the defender from the perimeter captain, bringing his life total to 33. At the beginning of Caleb's second main phase, Griffin has a very important response. Let's go ahead and move to that now. I'll go to my second main phase. All right, I will pay nothing for a high five. <laughs> okay. Did you, you ask if priority went around? Because uh, Priority goes true. around. I, I probably, okay, yeah, you're good, you're good? Okay, okay. Yeah, there yeah, we go. Okay. Yeah. All, All right. right. No response. <laughs> and moving back. All right. That's very important to me. Yeah, with that out of the way. <laughs> Caleb taps his soul ring to reattach his skull clamp to both of his spirits, drawing four cards. It's absolutely nuts. It's Every so time it happens. Nuts. He drew so many cards. All right. And with nothing else, passes his turn back over to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and casts Vampire Nighthawk, paying an extra mana to extort it with the Crypt Ghast. Each opponent is going to lose one life, gaining Landon a total of three life. Triggering Veto, seeing Landon gaining 3 life, and Landon deals 3 damage to Griffin. And with nothing else, goes to his end step. Peter untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn, and taps 5 mana for Fell the Mighty, targeting Perimeter Captain. The way that Fell the Mighty is worded, in, in Peter's deck, when he targets one of his creatures with Defender, the Fell the Mighty is going to trigger on all creatures that have more than 0 power, which is everybody else's creatures. Mm -hmm. So that single-handedly just removed all of our all of our commanders. Mm -hmm. Landon responds with casting Defile, targeting Kaikar. Responding to the cast, Landon also pays the Extort trigger on Defile, draining each of his opponents for one life and gaining him another three, which will trigger Veto, and he drains three life from Caleb. Can I ask you a question, yeah. actually? When you casted the Defile, why did you cast that on Kaikar, not one of um, Peter's creatures with the yeah that's a good question because i only had three swamps in play and all of all of peter's creatures were bigger than three so defile wouldn't have done anything okay that yeah. makes sense if now. i if i would have had like another swamp i definitely would have targeted one of i would have targeted the perimeter captain but like defile i only had three i missed like two land drops um so like i was super far behind and that crypt gas was like super important but like crypt gas doesn't make defile any better I just casted Defile because I didn't want to, uh, I wanted to use Crypt Ghast one more time before it died, basically. Kaikar will die from the minus three, minus three, and then the Fell, the Mighty, will resolve, destroying everything but Peter's two defenders. With nothing else, he ends his turn. Griffin untaps and draws and plays down a forest as his land for turn, and he taps out again to cast Rin and Seri, losing his three points. That's the thing about these these points is it incentivizes you not to play your commander again, but sometimes the points are not worth the commander because especially for Peter and I, our decks revolve around the commander more heavily um, than than our two opponents. They could possibly win without our command their commanders, but 
Actually, what inspired us to make this challenge was we wanted the other three point challenge to be kind of opposite of winning the game. So you can either go for the three points of only casting your commander once or you can go and try and win the game. So we felt like those two ideas were opposite enough that it would kind of take you in two different directions. So that's that was why we came up with those points. After casting his dog and cat, he's got nothing left to do and he goes and he ends his turn. Caleb untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and he taps all of his mana for his commander, Kaikar, losing his three points. So that's the second person that thinks it's worth it to lose those three points to get their commander back out. It really just adds something interesting to the game to have that choice whether you're going to choose those three points or if you're going to choose your deck more or whether you're going to choose your commander to, to lead you into victory. If I had a skull clamp, I'd cast my commander again with that commander. <laughs> With nothing else to do, Caleb ships his turn over to Landon. Landon untaps and draws and taps four mana for Revenge of Ravens. Super good enchantment in this in this scenario. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. How did you feel when the Fell the Mighty uh, destroyed all of your creatures? What was your thinking? Uh, I, I was pretty bummed because like I said, I, I've i missed at this point four land drops, I think. I haven't played a land in four turns. At that point, was that kind of the, the place where you kind of gave up? Yeah, it, it was a, like it was pretty demoralizing. I kind of felt like I was so far behind, and like I didn't know how I could compete with Caleb's Kaikar Skull Clamp combo, and like I didn't know how how I was going to compete with Peter's Arcades because he was drawing a card every time he casted a defender, and his deck is loaded with defenders. Um, and also, I didn't know how I was going to compete with Griffin putting like so many tokens into play. I kind of felt like my deck was like pretty far behind just from the start just because of like the specific strategy that i i was playing so that's how i felt yeah i i i when i saw the crypt guest specifically getting removed that was the thing that was keeping you in the same mana uh realm as everybody else so i mean for me it sent me back a turn but i still had mana to cast rin and Sari on my next turn but for you it was it was yeah, a blowout well, like rin and Sari, every card that you cast basically turns it into another card too right because you get a token with my commander, like, my commander doesn't give me card draw and it doesn't give me extra creatures. So, like, I'm basically one for one-ing when everybody else is, like, one for two-ing, even one for three-ing sometimes. So, I just kind of feel like I was super far behind, like, just from the start. Cool. With nothing else, Landon ends his turn and ships it over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and plays down an island as his land for turn and taps six mana to cast his commander, Arcades, losing his three points. At this point, we have three players that have chosen to play their commanders instead of keep those three points. So you can see how the, the decision is, is, is really breaking on us. He moves the combat, swinging the perimeter captain at Griffin. And with no blocks, Griffin takes four damage, dropping down to 31. With nothing else, Peter passes the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws. He then taps three mana to cast Herald's Horn, naming cats, giving all of his cats a mana reduction by one generic mana. He then taps one mana to cast Oresco's Explorer, which triggers Renan Seri and he gets a dog token. My first Momo token. First Momo. And he gets to search his library for a planes and put it into his hand. He then plays the planes as his land for turn and taps two mana for Miri Weatherlight Duelist. This will trigger Renan Seri again, giving him another dog. Another Momo. He then taps last of his mana, taking a damage from his pain land, bringing him to 30, and he casts War Clamp Mastiff, triggering Rin and Seri, and he gets his first cat token. I went from one creature on the board to seven creatures on the, board, on the board in one turn, and that is just the power of having something that creates tokens every time you cast a creature. Yeah, mine couldn't, my deck couldn't do that, so. <laughs> I would hope your deck couldn't do that. I would feel really weird if your deck was doing that. Yeah, I don't think I could have. <laughs> on Griffin's end step, Caleb has a response, and he casts terror targeting revenge of ravens this triggers kaikar getting a spirit and landon responds to the spell by casting snuff out losing four life to cast the spell for free targeting kaikar caleb responds to landon's snuff out by exiling arcane denial and paying a life to cast force of will for free targeting the snuff out this triggers kaikar and he gets another spirit with the force of will resolving countering the snuff out there are no further actions and caleb begins his turn Caleb untaps and draws and plays down Cascade Bluffs as his land for turn. He then pays 4 mana to cast Afara. He then pays 5 mana, sacrificing 3 spirits to cast Mizzix Mastery Overloaded, targeting the Preordain, Generous Gift, and Wear and Tear. He also gets a spirit from Kaikar. From the Preordain, he bottoms both of the cards and draws a card from the top of his library. He targets Rin and Seri with the Generous Gift, killing Rin and Seri and giving Griffin an Elephant. This made me very, very, very upset. Very mad. V livid. Crap hits the fan. Holy cow, it was like 100 degrees in there by the end of that turn. That's true. 
he chooses to cast the tear or the wear half of wear and tear targeting the herald's horn blowing it up he then gets three more spirits and with nothing else ends his turn you can you can destroy my artifacts you can destroy my enchantments you can destroy my lands but once you start destroying my dogs that's when i get mad oh and mad did he get Landon untaps and draws and plays down a Swamp as his land for turn. He then taps two lands to cast Knight's Whisper, drawing two cards and losing two life. He then pays two more mana to cast Malicious Affliction, targeting Kaikar, killing Kaikar again. This just shows we place tested these decks out before uh, we played this gameplay and Kaikar is a very scary deck. And if Kaikar is out, especially with that Skull Clamp, it can get out of control in one turn. So this, I know like Malicious Affliction is an inst is, it's an instant, so I could have casted this at any time, but Caleb was tapped out at this point, and I didn't think that I would get another chance to, to cast Malicious Affliction. And Malicious Affliction has a morbid trigger, so if another creature dies, I can actually copy Malicious, malicious Affliction to kill something else. But I didn't think that um, another creature was going to die at any point in time between my turn and Caleb's turn, and I was... I was really terrified of Kaikar. So that's why I main phase an instant. <laughs> With nothing else, Landon ends his turn and passes the turn back over to Peter. Peter untaps and draws and taps one mana for Port Portcullis Vine, triggering his commander, drawing him a card. Peter then goes into combat, swinging the Traproot Kami at Landon for six, Arcades at Griffin for three, and Perimeter Captain at Caleb for, for four. Griffin goes down to 27, Landon goes down to 28, and Caleb goes down to 28. In his second main phase, Peter plays down a Plains as his land for turn, and taps 5 mana to cast Seedborn Muse. That is just one of the scariest cards yeah, to see in a know, deck. I actually, when he, I wasn't that afraid when he casted it, because I was like, he doesn't have any creatures with activated abilities that he could mm -hmm. activate and abuse on every turn. Doesn't have, uh, like, let's say a, uh, lean line of anticipation or a chromatic, or a, um, I mean, still very powerful, like very powerful. Like, yeah. he, he has like interaction in his hand, like he's got all the mana to use it. So, I mean, it's super good, but like I wasn't as afraid of it as some of the other cards on the table. I was afraid of it because I was waiting for everybody to tap out so I could play my turn. That makes sense. With nothing else, Peter ships the turn back over to Griffin. Griffin untaps and Peter has a trigger on tapping all of his permanents due to the Seedborn use before Griffin draws. Let's move to the table and see how upset I am. I need revenge on Caleb, which means this needs to resolve. But I will let you choose. Okay. Um, no, I'm. I'm. Go ahead. I think we're all in the revenge on yeah, Caleb. Yeah. <laughs> Very upset. I wasn't that upset, but you kill my dog, you get the swing back. You what die. can you expect? Griffin then taps three mana for Beastmaster Ascension, and that is the card I'm more afraid of than than Seedborn Muse. At you least in this be. specific scenario. You should be. Yep. <clears throat> Griffin then goes to combat and swings everything but one dog at Caleb. Trigger on the Beastmaster Ascension, I have seven creatures attacking, so there are seven counters that are going to be placed on the Beastmaster's Ascension. Thank goodness that I was generous gifted from the Brennan Seri. If there was any other kill spell, I would not have had seven creatures out to trigger the Beastmaster Ascension. So now there are seven counters in Beastmaster Ascension. I will have all my creatures will get a plus five plus five buff. That's not very much. Caleb cannot block enough of this damage because of the Miri Weatherlight Duelist, and he dies. Just to um, reiterate Miri, when he is tapped, no player can block with more than one creature, and no player can swing at me with more than one creature. So even, even though he had creatures to block, he could only block with one of them, and there was enough damage with the rest of them to go through to kill Caleb. Yep. After the end of his very fruitful combat step, he plays down, he plays a Croson Verge as his land for turn, and with nothing else, passes the turn back over to Landon. Hey guys, Peter here with what appears to be our first foul call of Duel of the Peaks. There seems to be some confusion on the play, and Griffin only swung with six creatures instead of all the seven that he had. This makes it so Beastmaster's Ascension doesn't get the counters that it needs to pump up his creatures, which would have resulted in the game ending very differently, and Caleb would not be out of the game right now. After consulting with the referees, we've concluded that having the dog swinging at Caleb in the same fashion as the rest of the play will result in a similar outcome to the remainder of the match. So for the sake of the play consider that final dog token to be attacking caleb thank you for understanding back to you guys let me give a, go ahead and give a eulogy for caleb caleb played a good game 
he was definitely the scariest deck on the table to me and that is why i chose to to, to wipe him out first it actually wasn't because he generous gifted my rinser that that did make me upset but the thing is kayla was one or two turns away from popping off to the point where nobody else could stop it so it needed to be dealt with and i just happened to have some massive momos to take care of the job i in all honesty think that it was pretty much I, I think that was the correct play um just like the fact that he had skull clamp and his commander and a million ways of drawing cards with the skull clamp like i think he had the most powerful draw engine on the table oh no he had, um, from the start he had the most powerful deck and the most powerful board state of all of us thanks for playing caleb we love you buddy landon untaps and draws he then taps one to cast sensei's divining top in response to this peter casts eerie interlude Peter targets all of his creatures besides Seedborn Muse and Arcades, and they are exiled until the end of turn. Landon, with nothing else, leaving up a ton of mana for interaction, goes to his end step, and all of Peter's creatures come back into play. This triggers Arcades, seeing three creatures with Defender enter the battlefield, and he draws three cards. Peter also responds by casting a Dictative Crufix. Landon responds to this by casting Vraska's Contempt, targeting Arcades. Arcades is exiled and he puts it back into the command zone and Landon gets 2 life, bringing him up to 30. Peter untaps and draws and draws an additional card from the Dictate of Crufix. He plays down a Plains as his land for turn and taps 8 mana to recast his commander. He decides not to do anything else and ends his turn. I don't know what Peter was thinking of at this point too, uh, because all of his stuff was going to untap. I don't know if he was holding up... I mean, his lands would have untapped too, so I don't know exactly what was in his hand you know i think he should have swung at one of us he should have swung but, at one of us um, for sure i don't know maybe he wanted maybe he didn't want to swing at you because he didn't want anything like of his to die maybe i don't know i assume that he had interaction for miri i yeah, assume somebody I assume, had interaction i assume for so too but i guess we'll see what happens griffin goes his untapped step and peter untaps all of his permanents griffin draws and draws an additional card off of the dictative crufix griffin then taps out for crater hoof behemoth we got some massive momos up in here. Landon, in response, taps his sensei's divining top to hopefully pull a miracle off the top of his library. Did you pull it? No, I didn't. Oh, what'd you pull? A little swamp. Nice. Yep. Finally. Let's go ahead and move to the board to see this interaction, because it's actually pretty funny. I will tap two planes and an island for home evil. Draw a card off of Arcades. And then... Is it good? Tap three for Slaughter the Strong. What does it do? Uh, each player chooses any number of creatures he or she controls with total power for. Wait, how you It's a sorcery. Oh, shoot. You're right. It doesn't even matter. Okay. Dang it. With the Beastmaster's Ascension giving all of my creatures plus five plus five, casting the Crater Hoof, seeing eight creatures on the table are going to give my creatures an extra plus eight plus eight. So all of my creatures are getting a plus 13 plus 13 buff. They all have trample. That is enough to kill both Peter and Landon. Congratulations, Griffin, on a game well won. I'm super happy that your Inn and deck turned out really well. I knew that you were super excited to build the deck. And I also, you were like super skeptical that it wasn't going to be a good deck, but I knew the whole time. You didn't even activate the activated ability. Like you didn't even no. use half the card. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was very lucky on my part. To have a Beastmaster's Ascension, a Crater Hoof Behemoth, a Miri, none of them were killed, countered, or responded to. That was definitely just luck of the draw. I happened to have the right pieces, and nobody else had interaction for it. I think, honestly, that you kind of flew under the radar, too, which is a super huge strategy in Commander. Sometimes, like, you don't want to come out swinging and being the big bad boy at the table, because I think that's kind of what happened to Caleb. Not that he was trying to be so, but that's just kind of what his deck was wanting to do anyways. He popped off so fast that it was amazing. <laughs> immediately arch enemy from the start yeah and i wasn't focusing too much on on griffin because i was trying to like kind of slow down what caleb was doing because that skull clamp was just nuts with kaikar um in hindsight i i i if i was in your position i would do the same thing yeah yeah i was yeah i was trying to um also another thing that i was trying to do i was trying to rip all the counter spells out of caleb's hand so i could try and go for my combo eventually later on in the game but that ended up not even being relevant so so may i ask you a question mm -hmm. since i obviously was the strongest deck on the table at this why point why did i kill arcades why did you kill arcades yeah. instead of killing miri and making a deal with um peter to swing at me so in my mind i thought peter was going to go after me because i because like he's 
I was at a lower life, well, I wasn't at a lower life total than you. I, I, I just thought he was gonna attack me for some reason. Like, he can basically give all of his creatures vigilance. Um, and like attacking you doesn't really do much besides like giving you, getting you, or getting you mad at Kayla or at Peter. So I was like, I don't know. I kind of felt like I was the next in line. Um, and I was looking over at your board and I was just like, I don't really know like what one creature I could kill that would really make that big of a difference. Um, so here is what my thinking was on this turn. When you casted the Varaska's Contempt on Arcades, I was super relieved because here's what I thought was going to happen with Vraska's Contempt. You were going to talk to Peter and you were going to say, hey, listen, I've got a removal card for Miri. I will get rid of Miri if you swing at Griffin. Griffin is obviously the strongest deck on the table right now. D exiling the Miri, um, Peter will swing at me for a bunch of damage because I only have one blocker up. Um, because of this, I'll go down to something like seven or eight life. And that next turn, I was probably going to swing at Peter. Um, and and maybe leave myself open for you to deal or drain me for yeah seven. no i <clears throat> like i was so what's the word like disheartened because i had five lands in play I, I only had access to five mana my commander costed five mana i would have to take a whole turn off just to get my commander back into play and i only had like one other card in my hand besides the Vraska's contempt what was your other card exquisite blood um oh and i think i had like another random spell i can't remember but like so I was actually, really, I, I contemplated casting the Exquisite Blood instead of the Vraska's Contempt. However, I knew that if I casted, because Exquisite Blood is actually a really good card. It says whenever an opponent loses life, I gain that much life. So if I would have casted the Exquisite Blood when you killed Caleb, I would have gained that much life. I would have gained like 38, 38 life. Yeah. yeah. And that would have been, that would have brought me back into the game for sure. But I know for a fact, if I would have casted the Exquisite Blood, you would have not wanted to get revenge on Caleb. You would have come at me, right? Would you have done that? If I well, cast yeah, because the next turn you I cast Vito. I yeah. would win, right? So like, I really did not have like a good out. And only having five mana, I was like, there's no way with five mana in the cards that I have in my hand that anything I can do can result in me winning the game. That, that's where I was at. Because I was like, I exile Miri, but like I can't deal with the other Momos and all the other Momos that you're going to make. I can exile Arcades and maybe slow Peter down and maybe make Peter look more appealing of a target than me and maybe do something. So like, I really felt like I was just in a lose-lose situation. I think, and you let me know if you think this is the better play. I think the better play would have been to make a, make a deal with Peter to exile my Miri. Peter swings at me. All of his creatures have Vigilance. So even if I tried to swing at him, it would have been it would have been a hard swing, and I definitely would have tried to swing at him because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to keep myself alive. I think yeah. it might have made the game go on longer. That's true. I was just like I was super fed up with the game, honestly. Like I was so far behind. Um, I think even if I'd done that, it would have resulted in the same. Uh, what I have learned in Commander is even when I am super behind, there are so many times where there is a route to win. You just have to, to hold on long enough to find it. Yeah, I, in like a deck, um, I didn't know this deck super well. I had play tested it like once or twice, and I just, I don't know that the deck had anything in it that could have pulled me out of that spot. Um, Bubbling Muck might have. I would have had enough mana to cast Exquisite Blood and my commander again. Good job, Peter and Lennon, for both playing um, a game well played. I'm sorry that that fell to mind. He really blew you out there. Ah, it's okay. It's part of Commander. It's Wait. part of Commander. Well done, Peter. Your Arcades deck is just absolutely nuts. The Arcades, the fact that it has card draw on it and a win condition on it is just, it's so good. It's such a good deck. Yeah, the one thing that I noticed about Vito, and like one thing that you'll see throughout the entire game, I never had more than like two or three things on my board at once. Never. Like... I just, I always had a small board and I I just like wasn't able to like gain enough life to like um, buffer my small board state. And I, in Commander, like you can't survive by casting one spell per turn or like only adding to your board one per turn. Like it just, in, in casual like Commander, it just, it, it can't work. So anyways. Let's go ahead and move on to the rankings at the end of this game. All right, Griffin got a whopping five points, three for winning the game and two for hitting his and for getting the two point challenge of dealing 10 damage to each of his opponents, bringing him up to 35. Landon gets three points, bringing him up to 17. He only casted his commander once, mostly because he didn't really have enough mana to cast his commander a second time. <laughs> Good job, Landon. Thank you. Peter and Caleb get zero points. You lose. You get nothing. Good day, sir. 
Peter and Caleb get nothing. Peter stays at 25 points and Caleb is at 14 points. The final rankings are... Griffin is at 35, Peter is at 25, Landon is at 17, and Caleb is at 14. Looks like Caleb and I really need to start stepping it up. Um, together, both of our points, we are still behind Griffin. <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much for watching this video. We really hope you enjoyed it. We put a lot of work into these videos to, to provide you with like entertaining content that's a little bit different from other EDH channels. If you are new here or if you haven't subscribed yet, we'd really appreciate it if you consider hitting that subscribe button. Super quick, free, easy way of supporting our channel and it really helps us out a ton. We appreciate all your guys' support that you've shown us up until this point. We've just crossed 1200 subscribers as the day of recording this video. So that's awesome. You guys are awesome. We're so grateful to be part of this EDH community. Um, we look forward to bringing you guys more Duels of the Peaks. These will be coming out every month. And also don't miss our weekly deck tech videos that come out every Monday. We've got deck techs for Vito and Rin and Seri. Those will be in the show notes. So you can check that out if you wanna see more of the deck. And again, one more time, thank you guys so much. And we look forward to seeing you guys again next month. Thanks guys. See you later.